Okay, so this is Eric Siegel. I'm the director of sales for RBR. Welcome to the RBR webinar. This is uh, with Glenn Gorkwitz from Hui, talking about some of his relationships with the fishing fleet in Rhode Island. And I'll start by giving a very short introduction to the product that Glenn and his researchers and team have been using, which is called the RBR Concerto CTD. Uh, this will be about five or 10 minutes. And then we'll interview Glenn, introduce him, and then he will take it away for the rest of the, the webinar. Uh, so RBR makes sensors to measure the blue planet. And we talk about these as sensors. These are things that just make the core measurement. Loggers are integrations of sensors with batteries and memory. Uh, systems integrate several loggers and sensors together and may help uh, with telemetry or the moving profile. And then we also make OEM sensors. So these are CTDs that are often plugged into other products that you're buying. Uh, sometimes you know they're RBR sensors and sometimes you may not even know it, you just want the product that they're involved in. Uh, but the main product line is what you see here. These are uh, starting from the left, uh, an oxygen sensor and a temperature and pressure sensor. And then we have our line of CTD products, the Concerto, the Maestro and the Brevio. And then we also show what a compact logger looks like here. It's an RBR Solo T. Uh, but we're gonna focus on the RBR Concerto here. And customers, particularly researchers, use these because of the very high accuracy on conductivity, temperature, and depth. So the conductivity accuracy is 0.003 millisiemens per centimeter. For temperature, it's 0 0.002 degrees Celsius, and depth is 0.05% of full scale. So if you're operating in shallow water, you can choose a 20 meter pressure sensor, which gives you very high accuracy. If you're going down to very deep water, you can choose a deeper pressure sensor. The accuracy is the same, and of course, it's based on the full scale. Uh, but all the RBR products have, uh, all the concertos will log up to 240 million readings uh, on internal batteries and memory uh, and can sample up to 32 hertz. Uh, they can come in different configurations where you can get them uh, fast 8 hertz, fast 16, or fast 32. And then they come in three different product ratings for the pressure. This is based on the materials. These white ones here are built out of uh, a palm plastic material and it's rated to 750 meters. We also build them in titanium with pressure ratings of 200 meters, sorry, 2,000 meters and 6,000 meters. Uh, all of them have USB-C uh, to download, and they all come with twist activation and optional Wi-Fi. And we'll talk about how that has been used and how Glenn and his researchers are using that uh, with the fishing community. Uh, so the concertos are used for a variety of science projects, but in, and including some nice community science programs, which Glenn will be speaking about. This is a photo of him working with uh, a scallop fisherman named Mike off of Mike's boat uh, in Rhode Island. And here you can see the CTD on the left, and they're looking at data on the iPad that was telemetered through the Wi-Fi network, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, the Concerto can also measure more than just CTD. We can measure CTD plus two other channels. Typically, this would be uh, the RBR oxygen sensor and maybe a turbidity sensor or fluorometer. Uh, this is a nice way of measuring a lot of different things in still one small package. Uh, next up, we'll show two different iterations of what something similar to the, concert, the RBR Concerto CTD, but slightly different. We have the Brevio CTD, which uh, looks very much like the Concerto, but it's shorter. Instead of having eight internal batteries, it only has four, so it's about this much shorter, uh, but it still has the same accuracy specifications as the CTD and still can come in fast sampling and deep sampling. Moving at the other end of the spectrum, we have the RBR Maestro. Uh, this has the same logger body as the Concerto, but it has more real estate on the sensor interface side. So here we can hold up to 10 different channels. Uh, this might be CTD plus oxygen, fluorescence, turbidity, pH, PAR, ORP, uh, that whole gamut of things. And you can see the Brevio is used quite a bit in small boat surveys. It's really nice. This is literally handheld, handheld size. Uh, you can deploy it from any small boat with a small rope and you get world-class CTD accuracy, which is pretty impressive. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the twist and Wi-Fi next. So all of the standard loggers have twist activation. Uh, this looks like this, where you just twist with your hand from pause to run, and that either starts it running or of course puts it on pause. It also enables the Wi-Fi. So whenever you twist it to either run or pause, it turns the Wi-Fi on. And the Wi-Fi allows you to download the data and see the data uh, without having to actually open up the end. This means you can access the data while you're on the ship without having to worry about waves or rain or even humidity getting inside the logger and allows you to get the data off quite quickly. Uh, even months and months of data you can get off quite quickly. It's actually about the same speed as a RS-232 serial connection, so it's not slower in any way. 
Uh, it also allows you to see the data right away. This is used um, for researchers, maybe for strategic water sampling. You could do a cast, see where the mixed layer is, or see where the, um, the chlorophyll maximum is, and then do a, a special water sample there. Or it's really nice for community science groups where they get instant feedback to see that the, not only did it work, but actually what the conditions are. Um, and the Wi-Fi in, is pretty flexible. So you can use the Wi-Fi with Ruskin Mobile, as you see here. And this is applicable on, um, on phones and tablets, both iOS and Android. But it also can be worked with a normal desktop, and that's both Mac and PC. So here's what it looks like uh, in the Ruskin Mobile side. You can actually see the real-time data coming off. You can see how many samples, the, the run condition, whether it's run or pause, the sample rate. Um, you can view the data, you can stop it and start it, you can actually tag the data. Uh, another view will show you all of, this, all of the profiles you've collected. You can view them, of course, view the data, or you can push this button and push them up to Dropbox through, um, through Wi-Fi or through the cloud to share with your colleagues. And also keep in mind Ruskin Mobile will map your cruise, uses the GPS on the tablet or the phone. Uh, it maps your cruise here starting at um, cast one. It will also map where your casts are and the time of your upcast and downcast. So you can see here, if you hover over uh, cast five, it will show the downcast was at 11.52 to 11.56, and the upcast followed immediately from 11.56 to 11.58. Uh, last slide here is that we look at deployment consideration. So the, all the RBR equipment is very, very low power. Here you can see if the CTD is, is set up for 16 hertz continuous sampling, uh, round the clock at 16 hertz, it will run for 38 days before it runs out of memory. So if you think about this being at sea, maybe you're at sea uh, eight hours a day. So that's about, well, that's exactly one third of a day. You would run for uh, about 120 days uh, every day, making measurements eight hours a day before you need to change the battery. So that means you only need to change those eight batteries uh, a couple times a year. Okay, that's it for the products. Just letting you know that every week, same time, same place, we hold these webinars. Uh, the next two coming up next week, uh, Greg Johnson, CEO and president of RBR, will give an overview of a paper that was published uh, earlier this, this year in C-Technology that talks about the inductive conductivity cell on the RBR product uh, and all of the details that go along with that. It's very, very good webinar and information for anyone that's using CTDs. Uh, and then the week after that, Camilla from University of Hawaii will be giving us a presentation about her research using the RBR Solo D pressure and wave loggers to look at wave energetics in a reef environment in Hawaii or near Hawaii uh, and comparing the observations with the modeling. So that's going to be really interesting and I hope you can all join on August 19th. So I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and we're going to invite uh, Glenn to share his screen. I'm going to unmute him and I think we'll share his video um, and, uh, and then he'll join us right away. All right, we got you here. Hey, Eric. Well, yeah. I'll see you now with my screen. While you work on that, I want to introduce Glenn just a little bit. Uh, so Glenn Gorkowitz is a researcher at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I think you probably know that, which is why you've joined. Uh, I've known Glenn for a, a long time. Uh, I wanna say that uh, he is such an outstanding scientist, which is of course why we have him here, but, but more than that, uh, he is really, really good at working with students and, and uh, early career faculty. He's produced some really great researchers and spent a lot of time mentoring them, which is uh, always nice to see. But moreover, it's a really solid person. We like him. Uh, he always teaches us a lot. But I think his success in this program and with the fishing fleet uh, has a lot to do with the quality of the person he is and how approachable he is. Because I know scientists interacting with the fishing community over the last century has had a lot of um, problems, probably more than successes. And I think the success he has here is strongly attributed to how we can relate to them, work with them, and really find value with them. So. With that, Glenn, we're really happy to have you here. Uh, Is my screen up, Eric? Uh, no, not yet. Oh, gosh, I'll hit uh, share screen again. OK, oh, yeah, it's coming yeah, up now, which is great. Yep. OK, very good. We've Oop. got it now. Didn't want that so one. Just before you start, Glenn, I just would like to ask you a couple um, quick questions. One is, uh, could you tell the audience a little about your uh, experience, but probably most relevant to this specific project. 
um, my experience, uh, I've been working on um, shelf break research problems pretty much my whole career, uh, going right back to my uh, PhD days at the University of Delaware. And one of the things that really attracted me to problems in that area was on my first cruise at the shelf break, we caught a 16 foot shark, saw uh, uh, Russian uh, warships take one of our uh, uh, radio track drifters, uh, saw lots and lots of fishing activity. So I knew it was an area that was important economically. And I just kind of got hooked on the shelf break there. And I, I've really, really kept that as the focus of my research. Okay, that's excellent. And so we get to see some of that, uh, some of that payback now. And so another thing we'd like to do with these is to hear a fun fact about you, Glenn, that maybe some of your colleagues even at we don't know. Okay, so uh, I'll go back to childhood. And uh, in honor of I, I, I say yes there, uh, when I was 10 years old, I actually survived a Category 5 hurricane, uh, Hurricane Camille in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And we lived in Gulfport, Mississippi at the time. So. Wow. Okay. I'm sure you remember that one. That's, uh, that's a good one. <laughs> And I'm glad you survived. Okay, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quiet now. I'm going to um, turn my video and microphone off and leave it to you. We're, we're looking forward to this presentation. Thank okay, well, well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Uh, I've had wonderful interactions with RBR at meetings and workshops and, and uh, when folks visit uh, Woods Hole uh, there. And um, uh, I, I like to talk about really a project that's been one of the most rewarding of my entire career. And it really does show uh, how uh, serendipity plays a big role in your career. I never could have imagined moving in this direction except for uh, a number of chance occurrences there. And so uh, <clears throat> I'll be talking about the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation Hui Shelf Research Fleet. And um, our team working on it right now are uh, Frank Barr, who's an engineer uh, at Woods Hole and has been working very closely with the CTD data, uh, as well as training. Uh, Aubrey Ellertson, uh, uh, who works directly with the fishing vessels and all the fishers there. And the new executive director of the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation, uh, Dave Bethoni. And uh, also, I do want to um, mention uh, an alumnus there, Anna Mercer, who uh, was there at the start and really helped uh, get things going there. So uh, the outline of the talk is as follows. I'll talk about the uh, origins of the shelf research fleet. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll briefly describe data collection and what our scientific goals are. Uh, I'll have two slides on recent changes in the Gulf Stream and Continental Slope that really point out to the, the real importance of community science right now. And I'll, I'll, I'll then tell two uh, uh, science stories. The first one is the use of the shelf fleet for extreme event detection. And that's the marine heat wave of early 2017 there where communications enabled by the shelf fleet really, really enabled us to, to uh, identify a, a very unusual event. And then I'll, I'll talk about how we use the shelf fleet data to actually study a specific shelf break exchange process, uh, the picnic line salinity maximum intrusions. And uh, this is um, current work right now uh, uh, where we're polishing up a manuscript on that. So this is pretty much hot off the press there. And then finally, uh, I'll close with future directions. So the uh, meandering path really began at public hearings for the National Science Foundation uh, Pioneer Array. Uh, there's a huge program called the Ocean Observatories Initiative. Uh, uh, were multiple ocean observatories around the world. And as part of the permitting process, there were public hearings. And these were in early 2011, the National Science Foundation ran these. And I, I think it's fair to say they did not go entirely successfully. And so we needed to have another set of meetings uh, which involved multi-use negotiations. Now the Pioneer Array is located south of New England. It's been in since uh, uh, 
2014. Uh, the mooring array is this little uh, yellow rectangle right here. Uh, autonomous underwater vehicles operate in this red box, and then gliders operate in this, this white re rectangle right here. And I was uh, sitting in the back of the room, uh, uh, I believe it was at the public library, library in New Bedford, and um, things got really heated. And I walked out into the hallway with the woman sitting next to me, who turned out to be the executive director of the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation, Peg Parker. And she said, this is not going well. There's, there's a better way to, to navigate this. And so uh, I introduced myself. I, I had been hiding under my winter jacket up to that point. And uh, uh, we, we exchange business cards and talked about mutual interests and how perhaps the Pioneer Array could be used uh, uh, for the benefit of industry and that there might be a positive path forward there. So several months later, uh, uh, Al Pluteman, the current lead scientist for the uh, Pioneer Array, was tasked by the National Science Foundation to negotiate with a group from the fishing industry. And uh, he contacted the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation, and um, uh, uh, Peg Parker was then asked to run the multi-use uh, negotiations there. And so she, she thankfully accepted, and um, I was able to be part of the science team. And it was really extraordinary, the meetings, because I learned so much about the fishing industry. And uh, being a scientist uh, out there periodically, you certainly see vessels, you, you uh, have interactions at, at various levels, but to actually sit down and talk about how to, uh, to use this region of the ocean uh, with this science infrastructure was just very enlightening to me. And there were some very contentious moments. Uh, uh, we worked through them. Uh, it ended up being four four-hour negotiating sessions uh, with the uh, uh, the referee being a staffer from Senator Sheldon Whitehouse's office to make sure that we all negotiated in good faith. We ended up with a 44-page report with multiple suggestions from the uh, industry. And um, uh, the most important was to stagger the mooring so that fishing vessels could get through. And, and thankfully, that was... Uh, 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 put into place. So a funny thing happened at the end of the, those uh, uh, meetings there. Um, three of the, uh, uh, the fishers there uh, came up to Al Pluteman and I and said, you know, we've actually enjoyed talking to you guys and, and we've learned something here. So, uh, you know, you're oceanographers and everything. It's December 16th right now. It's 70 degrees over the continental shelf. So why don't you tell us why that is? Uh, and you know, we we hope that we can keep up the communications. So um, uh, I said, okay, I'll I'll you know take on this challenge. I'll I'll get on Google and see what's going on. It turns out that there was a big diversion of the Gulf Stream at the time, uh, and. Uh, uh, it sent a lot of very warm water onto the continental shelf. They were getting four and five knot currents at the edge of the continental shelf. Uh, you can see in this plot right here, uh, uh, that's the speed of a drifter that went from Cape Hatteras to the south flank of George's Bank in eight days. And uh, we ended up getting a paper uh, uh, about this uh, uh, Gulf Stream an uh, anomaly here. Uh, and this is a sea surface height anomaly figure that Magdalena Andres worked up, and you can see uh, the north wall of the Gulf Stream here almost hitting the shelf break right there. So that was really, really invigorating. I wouldn't have known <clears throat> anything about this event if uh, 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 Fred and, and David and Norbert hadn't been, been uh, telling us about it there. So about six months later, uh, an opportunity came up at Woods Hole to uh, write a proposal to the MacArthur Foundation. And uh, it, it had to do with adaptation to climate change. And uh, I contacted Peg. We thought that 
uh, getting some community science with uh, the fishing community uh, uh, deploying CTDs would, would really uh, uh, be very useful there. And so uh, uh, in talking, uh, uh, Frank Barr, uh, Peg Parker, Anna, Anna Mercer and I, uh, uh, Mike Long was involved at that point there. Uh, our strategy was to get fishing vessels to take regular CTD profiles across the continental shelf at one week intervals. And the choice of the CTD was really crucial. And I'm glad Eric went over the, uh, 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 the virtues of the uh, concerto there. Uh, both the accuracy uh, as well as the wireless capability was something that we really wanted because we did not want crews to have to be worrying about uh, taking end caps off, downloading data, and the ease of the iPad interface and the rapid plotting was a real virtue. Uh, so we decided to divide the continental shelf into six zones stretching between Montauk Point and Martha's Vineyard. I'll show a map of that in a minute. And we wanted to do multi-year sampling to look at both seasonal and interannual variability. Now it turns out that one of the most important parts of the whole project was just regular interaction because We've been talking about the meaning of these observations and the changes uh, uh, very regularly. And it's been fantastic to get periodic emails about, hey, here, here's a weird fish. Oh, here's uh, a mortality event. What's going on with this? It's just incredibly enriched my understanding of the ocean south of New England. So now, uh, uh, Everything started in, in uh, uh, October and November 2014. Uh, and here's Anna Mercer right here, uh, passing uh, iPads around right here with Ruskin. Uh, here's Frank Barr uh, uh, over here. Uh, there's Mike Marchetti uh, uh, right there, uh, Greg Mataronis. Uh, and um, so the training took, uh, uh, with feedback and, and uh, 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 getting the organization of which vessels would go out at which time probably took a month or two uh, uh, to work out. There were some, some uh, uh, teething with the, uh, the wireless as well, some, some adjustments that we needed there. Uh, but uh, here's what <clears throat> we've accomplished to, to date there. And, and this has just really been a team effort. And I just cannot thank the dedication of the fishers that are out there enough. Uh, this is from a figure from Frank Barr from our, our website right here. Uh, so as of July 30th, uh, what's that, less than a week ago, 646 profiles. And here's the spatial distribution of all these profiles. Here's the six different re rectangles across the continental shelf right here. And some boxes are certainly more represented than others. Uh, boxes one and two, not surprisingly, we have the most data. Uh, <clears throat> the Pioneer Array are, is in boxes five and six, so that hasn't been as critical. And I certainly recommend people to go to the uh, uh, website there. Uh, uh, Frank has, has processed and plotted all the individual profiles right there as well as monthly average sections and a lot of other data. Uh, uh, Frank's done, done a wonderful job with that. So I, I wanna return to the, this aspect of the regular uh, interactions right now. And uh, here's, here's that same photograph uh, uh, that Eric showed earlier. Uh, I actually went out for a day with uh, uh, Mike on the, on the Mr. G, uh, uh, along with um, Mike Long here. Uh, to film a video about the shelf fleet. And there's a nice seven or eight mi uh, minute video on the uh, CFRF website right there. And one of the, the really uh, <clears throat> most remarkable things about the interactions are, are the annual meetings, which are usually in late January. And um, uh, Anna and I used to split about 20 minutes of presentation and we would usually go between two and three hours with all the discussion. Uh, just remarkable uh, discussions, hearing about what, what the catch has been like, questions about the future of ocean predictability, just incredibly wide-ranging uh, 
uh, discussions. I do have to say, you have to be on your toes. Uh, the, uh, uh, the baloney detectors are, are quite sensitive. And uh, I know whenever I, I strayed off of things that I knew, it, I, I, there was a, a pretty good reminder that I, I really didn't know what I was talking about there. So it was very bracing, uh, 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 real, really just wonderful interactions. So now I'd like to shift over to recent changes in the Northeast and why the shelf fleet data is so important. Um, <clears throat> I was out on a cruise in, uh, uh, off of uh, Virginia and uh, uh, North Carolina in May of 2012. And we were looking for the shelf break front and some, some cold water fish. And we had a six degrees C warm anomaly down there. And I, I had just never seen anything like it. It completely removed the normal four to six degree C temperature difference across the, 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 uh, the shelf break front in that region. And I was fortunate to have a postdoc, Ke Chen, who was coming from North Carolina State University. And he looked at NDBC buoys for 2012 and actually found that the jet stream stayed very far north for about six weeks that winter. And it, it reduced the, the uh, heat loss from the ocean to the atmosphere by 50% that winter, uh, uh, which I, th I thought was, a, was astounding. It's still the warmest conditions we've had uh, uh, in the middle Atlantic bite here. And this really highlights how this region is being affected by the jet stream and large scale changes in the, the uh, atmospheric dynamics. I should add that Jennifer Francis of the Woods Hole Research Center has done some really nice work linking Arctic amplification in the atmosphere with the, uh, the jet stream changes. And, and it's something we're, we're following pretty closely. The second big change <clears throat> is actually offshore. And as a result of the interactions with the fishers uh, there, and in particular at a workshop in January 2013, where Fred Matera gave a summary of what the, the fishing fleet had been observing for oceanographic conditions, he said that the Gulf Stream influence was much greater and it actually changed the research trajectory of several of us at Woods Hole and the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, Magdalena Andres published a paper in, in 2016 showing that from sea surface height anomalies, the longitude at which large amplitude meanders of the Gulf Stream uh, have, have originated has shifted drastically to the west there. This is 1995 right here, where it's at about 55 west, you, you hit meanders of, of uh, a certain variance. And in uh, <clears throat> 2014, you can see again, similar to that uh, earlier instance in the fall of 2011, uh, the Gulf Stream practically hitting the shelf break there. Also, uh, Avijit Gangopadai and his group uh, uh, at, at SMAS, uh, UMass Dartmouth, have been going back and carefully analyzing the Gulf Stream analysis charts from Jennifer Clark. And his group has found that there was a big regime shift in the year 2000, such that the uh, warm core ring formation rates jumped from 18 a year to 33 per year. And this has had tremendous impacts on the continental slope and the continental shelf south of New England, and also obviously on the uh, ecosystem. So now, <clears throat> how do we use the shelf fleet data to actually detect these extreme events? Um, in January of 2017, I got an email uh, forwarded to me by Anna Mercer saying, Mike Marchetti is seeing some really weird bycatch right now. And it's so unusual that he's taking photographs of it and having to look up his fish books there. But uh, this is a, a Gulf Stream flounder, 
uh, that he's, he's caught off of Block Island, which is uh, way up here at the 30 meter isobath in January. So that's a Gulf Stream fish in January that they're catching in shallow water. And <clears throat> there were also uh, juvenile black sea bass. While black sea bass are common in the spring and summer, uh, they're not at all. They've, it had not appeared before in January. So that was very unusual. So uh, we immediately looked at the, uh, uh, the shelf fleet data from these two profiles right here, the small green dots. And uh, this blue line right here is temperature from January 29th. Uh, and you can see that it's 10 degrees C. Uh, uh, and by mid-February, it dropped back to about 7 degrees C, which is more usual. Uh, offshore at the shelf break along this line, uh, Robert Todd processed glider data and showed that it was 15 degrees C out here. Uh, and <clears throat> much larger, we would have expected to see something more like this uh, with 7 degrees C water right here. So the, the temperature anomaly on January 17th was about 5.5 degrees centigrade there. And again, uh, this warm water was getting 100 kilometers shoreward of the shelf break. And um, uh, a colleague of mine at Woods Hole, uh, Ying Song Lin, was doing some work at the uh, uh, offshore wind turbine off of Rhode Island and had a CTD out. He actually took it in for calibration because he thought it was broken because the temperatures were so high. So how unusual uh, were these, these temperatures? So uh, we put this figure in a paper that was in Oceanography Magazine back in 2018 in a special uh, issue on the Pioneer Array. But <clears throat> if we actually look at the uh, shelf fleet uh, uh, temperature right here from January of 2017 compared to all historic data between January and March before 2003, when there's been a, a pretty significant warming trend, we can see uh, uh, the distribution right here up to 2003, uh, uh, a maximum at, centered on six degrees C here. Uh, uh, really, uh, from these limited observations, again, it's the winter, so there's a lot fewer observations, but you can see it's, it's way out on the tail here. And similarly, in terms of the salinities, uh, again, we're, we're uh, uh, talking about relatively high salinities there, uh, consistent with ring water coming onto the continental shelf. But the shelf fleet data was absolutely instrumental in both the initial detection, the characterization south of, of New England, and it led to uh, a large group of us actually tracking this, uh, this intrusion down uh, along the Middle Atlantic Bight. So this uh, was detected January 1st initially. Here's the CFRF study region right here. We saw it cross the Oleander Line. Uh, then National Marine Fisheries Service survey identified it, and it finally left the continental shelf north of Cape Hatteras four months later uh, uh, there. And so we were able to track it. It had an advection rate of about nine centimeters a second uh, consistent there. So now we want to be able to say something. What are the ecological consequences of this? And uh, uh, with some helpful hints from reviewers of the uh, original manuscript, we were able to dig out two ecological consequences of this marine heat wave. Uh, first of all, uh, from a press release from Kevin Friedland from the National Marine Fisheries Service, the shelf-wide chlorophyll A for 2017 was the lowest on record from 1998 to 2017. And also, there was an unusual mortality event in 2017 for humpback whales. Now, uh, as that warm water went inshore, the shelf break front actually migrated a pretty good distance on shore. So I think it's an open question as to whether or not the humpback whales were following the front inshore 
and then encountered both more fishing gear in shallow water as well as more ship strikes. So that's something I'm certainly looking forward to talking more to cetologists about. So now uh, I, I'd like to uh, briefly describe how we use the shelf fleet data to study specific ocean processes. And the process uh, I'd like to talk about is something called the, the picnicline salinity maximum uh, intrusion. I'll just call it the salinity maximum intrusion. And this was uh, originally uh, identified uh, uh, a good while ago by uh, uh, Bill Boycourt and Peter Hacker. There was a nice paper on this by uh, Arnold Gordon and Frank Aikman in 1981. Uh, and it has been identified from individual CTD profiles. And it's basically uh, a maximum that's typically at the depth of the, the peak stratification, peak n squared here. And there was a very nice climatology paper by Steve Lentz in 2003, where he defined a number of characteristics for these uh, uh, features right there. And in his paper, he concluded that this can raise the, the salinity of the, the uh, entire wa water column by 0 0.3 PSU. So they can really carry a significant amount of salt uh, on shore. The horizontal scales and the temporal scales are not well established, but we'll be doing a National Science Foundation field program next year to try and map these out with autonomous underwater vehicles. So uh, <clears throat> two important characteristics uh, uh, here are the, the value of SMAX itself, the salinity, uh, and, and the depth that, that it appears at. And so first of all, we can map out where profiles from the shelf research fleet have these SMAX intrusions. And this is for the entire time period, 2015 to 2019, uh, uh, and uh, working with uh, uh, Frank Barr, Aubrey Ellertson, and Paula Fratantoni at the National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, we examined 621 profiles in this time period. And the red crosses here are where the, uh, 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 those are profiles with these intrusions. We actually had to use a larger delta S because there were so many intrusions that if we had used 0 0.1, there would have been many, many more profiles there. And one thing to point out, this is the Pioneer Array right here, is that these are getting up to 100 kilometers shoreward of the shelf break front. So <clears throat> uh, again, uh, I just want to summarize two important aspects of these uh, 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 intrusions. This is a uh, histogram of the, the uh, maximum salinity right here. And you can see it can get up over 36 right here. So that's uh, pretty much Gulf Stream water right there. And it can get down as low as about 31.5. But at least for this time period, 2015 to 19, it was you know, a little bit over uh, 33, 33.6 right there. And the depth, that, the mean depth over uh, the uh, entire time period uh, uh, there, uh, these were at 22 meters right there, uh, with a mean thickness of about 15 meters there. So these are ecologically significant because they, they potentially can carry organisms that might be larval fish or we're thinking potentially squid, uh, uh, very large distances on shore. And, and so, uh, you know, we'll be continuing the close interaction with the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation, uh, uh, even on this National Science Foundation project, and continuing to talk to industry about when they've had good catches and when they've, they've uh, and when we see these intrusions. So now here's the, uh, 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 I think the, the punchline for what we've seen so far, which is that the frequency of these intrusions have really changed a lot since uh, Steve Lentz's climatology that went up to about 2001, 2002 in terms of data. Uh, th this is uh, uh, by month, the um, uh, uh, frequency 
of these SMAX intrusions in the total number per month. And uh, uh, the maximum amount in the climatology was about 25% of the time, but we can see it's almost 48% of the time for August right now for that five year time period. Pretty similar in September uh, as well there. And even in the spring, it, it's uh, considerably more frequent. And uh, I've been out on other cruises where we've seen very dramatic examples of this. So, uh, you know, this is very much ongoing research. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll also be working with uh, Ruth Musgrave uh, from Dalhousie uh, on this. So anyways, those are uh, 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 two uh, short science stories about how we've used the, the, the shelf research fleet, you know, and, and I hope that I've given you a, a little bit of an understanding of how we were able to, to make these connections and really find mutually beneficial avenues of interaction. And uh, uh, so I, I just like to talk about uh, the future now um, and, and where we hope to see this going forward. We were originally funded by the MacArthur Foundation, but their emphasis shifted from climate adaptation to actually trying to reduce carbon emissions. And so we were not renewed. Uh, I had to do some uh, quick uh, uh, marketing there, and we were able to find a small family foundation in Newport, Rhode Island that generally funds healthcare uh, in Rhode Island, as well as his renovation of historical buildings in Newport. And we were able to convince them, hey, this is important. This is an issue dealing with the economic resiliency of coastal communities in Rhode Island. Uh, <clears throat> we recently got uh, extended for two more years with that. Uh, uh, and so uh, we'll be able to collect data through uh, the spring of 2021 but we hope to write a large NSF proposal uh, that can extend this, this fleet by five years there. So we have lots of fingers and toes crossed with that. Now I mentioned uh, that the, the salinity intrusions could possibly relate to the changing uh, population dynamics of squid in the region. Uh, Ilex, the, the northern short fin squid, which is normally out at the shelf break, kind of comes and goes in waves. And it, it's very much um, subject to very large interannual variability. But I was fortunate enough to be invited to a workshop last November to talk about how uh, uh, recent catches uh, uh, have occurred and, and what might be causing them. And I just got an email from Anna Mercer yesterday with an update. For the last four years, there's really been a large catch of ILEX squid. And we think that there's some connection to that increased Gulf Stream forcing there. But again, we need to look more carefully in terms of the time at which the SMAX intrusion occurs and other possible forcing mechanisms. But that's something where we're using that data uh, uh, directly to try and understand uh, uh, issues of, of, of real practical and economic importance for the, the fishing fleet. Um, also, uh, uh, we've had uh, uh, a student at, at the Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, uh, there, Elena Perez, who's been looking at the marine heat wave uh, in 2016, uh, uh, along with their main supervisor, Svenja Ryan, a postdoc at Hui there. And that's a year of particular interest because it, uh, it was actually called squid NATO because there were so many uh, uh, squid that were caught that year. I believe that is uh, in homage to the popular film Sharknado, uh, which I, I need to see sometimes in the future. And then uh, uh, finally, uh, Dave Bethoni and Aubrey uh, let me know that uh, they were asked uh, uh, on another one of their projects uh, dealing with the offshore wind industry about using the shelf fleet protocols uh, uh, with the RBR instruments to uh, 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 continue to collect data in this region. And I was, of course, delighted uh, 
uh, uh, you know, that the shelf fleet protocols and, and interactions can continue there. And so finally, to, to uh, conclude, one of the things I would really like for the future is for, to buy lots of RBR instrumentation. I didn't do so well with the NSF proposals this last February, so it's just more motivation to write some more proposals. And uh, uh, with, with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, uh, take any questions there. Excellent, Glenn. Thank you very, very much. I know the two take-home messages I have for that are that the fishing community are good baloney detectors <laughs> and, and to trust your equipment. If you think it, the water looks hot, you should trust your RBR CTDs because it is hot. Actually, March, 12th, uh, March 2012 was my first March in, living in Boston, and I remember it being very, very warm. Um, even in the water, I have a photo of me taking my kids kayaking in March, which really doesn't happen. Oh, if, I, if I find that again, I'll send it to you. So you've raised a lot of good points and uh, so we've got some text questions already coming in. Uh, Great. Can you see the text window at the bottom? Um, uh, if not, yeah, now I can me... uh, read it to you. Oh, actually you better read. I think I accidentally closed that no window. No problem. So we've got a question from Alfonso who talks about um, uh, the marine heat wave in the North Atlantic as, see, as seen from sea surface temperature is impressive and he's curious about the vertical extent of the event below the surface. And he wonders if your shelf fleet, the CTD profiles would allow you to look at it um, as the event de develops, maybe see it before uh, sea surface temperature picks it up. Yes, uh, that's a, a great uh, uh, comment and, and question there. In fact, in, in 2017, uh, uh, we did look at the profiles very closely. They were, there was really very little vertical uh, structure there. So we chose to present depth average data there. Uh, but um, the whole issue of subsurface uh, uh, structure for the marine heat waves really needs a lot more attention. And, and that's something we, we are already looking at with the marine heat wave in 2016. Okay. And we have another question from Alice who she says, great talk. Uh, any advice for starting a community science project? Uh, what have you found that works and doesn't work? And what do you wish you knew before you started? I think you probably have a lot of lessons learned. That's a, boy, that's a really uh, good, deep question. Um, I would say the way to, to, to start out would be to go to some kind of public event uh, 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 in where the fishing industry uh, may be represented and learn about the issues that the industry is facing. And so much of this depends on personal interactions. And the word that I heard over and over in those first four, four hour sessions was the word trust there. And so you need to make the initial contacts uh, uh, there, which is difficult. It's not always easy to find the right people. And the first people that you talk to may not always you know, be the, the ones that you uh, end up going with. But I would say uh, just having a genuine curiosity and wanting to learn about the problems that, that industry is facing is really the first step there. And then uh, the second is follow up, follow up, follow up. Uh, I always tried to answer my emails, you know, as soon as I could uh, from CFRF. I wanted people to know uh, that they were a priority. Uh, I always expressed my appreciation when I got new information uh, uh, there. And, and I think the third thing is then to keep an ear out for funding opportunities because community science is very difficult to fund. Everybody likes it. It is a media magnet uh, uh, there, but it, it, it is tricky. And, and talking to other people, I think, uh, uh, you know, who are doing community science is really important. Okay, and that's your, it sounds like you've got some really, really good points there. Finding some small projects to, small wins to build trust sounds like a good way to go. So she also has a follow-up question, which is, uh, it's more on the science end, specifically saying, have you thought about using, adding fluorometers to the CTDs oh, to understand gosh. the ecological impact? I know you talked about 
uh, change in chlorophyll over the years. So that would be right on. Yeah, that no, that, that would be absolutely great. Uh, uh, I will have to ask uh, Dave and Aubrey a, about that. Uh, I, I would love to have uh, chlorophyll data. That, that would really be fantastic. Well, start now and then you'll have it later. Oh, yes. I, <laughs> I, I think I requested a quote earlier in the year. So. <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, so let's see, they've both written thanks uh, to your answers and we'll open it up for more questions. Uh, we'll see if someone puts something in. Uh, while we wait for other questions to come in, I do have a question. You showed that chlorophyll plot from shelf-wide chlorophyll and 2017 was uh, a 20-year low. Mm -hmm. But I think 2012 looked like it was quite high. And I'm just wondering if there's a reasoning between why one would yeah, be high and one would be low. Boy, that, you know, that's a darn good question. I mean, that really gets into the issue of how the marine heat waves are affecting the timing of the spring bloom. Mm. And uh, uh, let's see, I believe there was a paper by someone at Rutgers about uh, uh, the spring blooms there. That might have been two or three years ago. Uh, I forget the exact year, but no, no that, that's a great question. I, I think the full ecological consequences of these marine heat waves are, not, are still not well understood. And part of it is because sometimes you get the jet stream, you know, uh, mucking things up, and sometimes it's the Gulf Stream mucking things mm. up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the horizontal scale and the duration may be very different between those sure. two. Yeah, and the timing, because actually if I looked at 2013 is a low point. So it depends it on yeah. where 2012 started and where the data starts and ends. And yes, where it's yes. Sampled. Okay, excellent. Uh, I don't see any other questions coming out at the moment. Uh, we'll keep it open. Is there anything else you want to share? No, just, uh, uh, you know, it's just been a marvelous uh, experience. And uh, uh, I, I really, uh, uh, you know, can't say enough about all my interactions. When you do, you know, get across that trust barrier there, people have been so kind to me and have shared anecdotes, they've shared videos. Uh, it's just truly been extraordinary. Excellent. It's, it was a great presentation. I'm going to pause.